Hi, it's Gadget UK here again, back for part three of the A4000 repair. The way we left it in the previous video, it uh, wasn't booting. We swapped the Super Buster chip over and uh, there was lots of corrosion around the socket. It was also uh, still suffering with a twangy audio, which uh, it had been suffering from in part one and part two. There's also a number of things we needed to finish doing just to clean the board up and finish things off. Well, this is super annoying because it's now not booting uh, and it's going to be connection around here. So I cannot easily show you this because I'm going to have to get so close up to this. I'm using the new solder iron here, the Heiko. Um, let me just see if I can see what I'm doing here. Yeah, so if I uh, get onto one point here, like this, I'll show you. I've just got some chip quick flux there. And I'm just going to go across the individual points on the socket there like that. One at a time, all the way around. The ones in the corners are the most corroded and that's going to be the hardest to get to. But I'll have to do it off camera. I mean, I can show you another one here. Let's just uh, do that one. Yeah, it's just going to be a case of just heat and reflow. I have to add a little bit of solder as well. But uh, yeah, it's going to be that simple, I think. Well, that's a relief. Uh, twanginess aside, it's working. So there you go, that's an example of why in part one, when I said I was uh, kind of bricking it, uh, you know, a bit nervous about, apprehensive about working on this, you can understand why. Because the very process of just removing this chip, it broke some of the solder points here, you know, that were just hanging on. These hadn't been all reflowed properly. So you, can you see this side here? It's nice and shiny. And up here, it looks a bit dirty, but you know what? It's not. It's nice and shiny. So I did three sides there. I did this side, that side, and that side. I need to do more cleaning up, but uh, I did a primer, uh, you know, put a preliminary click clean around there. The points that I think were definitely the issue, and you couldn't really see them, but the very corner point up here, the very corner points down here, and the one down here, because you can't get the iron in. I had to literally touch, there's a piece of plastic in the corner, I had to touch that plastic and just leave that plastic melting while I was touching the pin. Because even with the finest tip I've got, which is uh, as small as that there, you're touching the plastic, you can't avoid it, it's impossible. They probably fit them with hot air or something similar in the factory. Um, but nevertheless, we've got really nice solder points here all the way around. Now this side, I left this side because you remember there was a couple of wires. As I showed you, there's a couple of wires and I didn't think this was the issue. But there are some pretty crusty points there. One thing I've noticed is uh, very carefully under magnification, just touching the pins down here that look a bit grey and the whole pad is moving with the pin just on two or three here so you know what I ain't going near this bit down here but what I will do is just get a bit of flux on here now and just reflow the one or two individual ones there that I think need it because there are a few uh, but I am not touching those bridge wires there because if I do I am never going to be able to repair it those wires you can't even see them I'll put you on macro in a minute so you can see them but they are so small and the traces and things are there are so small that the likelihood of me being able to reflow those is next to none. I'd have to put a new socket on, I think. And you know what? I think I'd do more damage putting a new socket on there, removing this, putting another one on. You know, some of the pads, as I say, are floating. We might end up with more uh, wires down here. The other problem you've got is, because it's not through hole, you've got to solder to the connections here, pretty much. You know, if the uh, pads on the socket not making a connection to the PCB, you've got a huge problem with this type of component. You'd have to stick little bits of solder on the edge of the uh, socket, the connections here, and have wires on the top side. It would be an absolute mess and a nightmare. So you can understand my apprehension about trying to disturb this area down here further. But the issues I've dealt with, that would have been causing the black screen. I'm convinced of it because that was what was happening. It was just not booting from the hard disk at all. So I'm adding some light from my uh, phone here, and uh, apologies, you can't see very well, but like I said, the first four or five, six pins on the left have done. These ones have got flux on. So they're going to kind of look weird, but yeah, I don't know that you can tell from there. Some of those are absolutely crusty as anything. You can see the two wires on the end there. If you look at the ones I've done on the left hand side there, look how nice and tidy those ones look. Those have all been reflowed, but yeah, some of these here, if I move the light a little bit, you might be able to see them a bit clearer. The crusty as anything. The solder's awful. Anyway, let's just see what happens now. So just keep your eye on the LED there. Let me make sure that everything's connected up before uh, I apply the power. I don't see any issues. One thing to watch for is things like this. If that was on the jumper, went into a pin header somewhere, you know, you could have a, a big problem. So just make sure that things like that are out of the way. But if you keep your eyes on the LED, let's see what happens. 
see that flicker? Flicker, flicker. It's looking for the floppy, so there is an extended pause when you've got no floppy drive. That then it should start flickering as it boots. There we go, it's booting away. Flash, 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 flash. Flashing like mad. There we go, fantastic. Thank God for that. It's like I say, you, you, know, you never know when you remove things like that. You create yourself a whole world of pain. I think I've narrowly referred to disaster. So I'm filming this on uh, Boxing Day morning actually. So after the shenanigans we had a few days ago with the uh, connections around there, uh, I'm so relieved I got that working. I cleaned up the uh, CPU card here, you can see. Can you see how much cleaner it is? There's hardly anything on there. There's still a few little bits, so I'll give it uh, another clean later, but it's uh, a lot cleaner now. I thought, I'm just going to test it, and I've just done that. I've just tested the 1200, actually, just to listen to how Dune sounds with regards to those twangy bits. And you know what? On the 1200, I don't hear them at all. So there is something, and I don't think it's the CPU. I don't think it's the 68060. The 68060 might be affecting the uh, wind noise at the start in terms of it being stored. It's kind of like a sample. I'm thinking it's a timing thing, it could be the 060, the same thing with Aladdin, but that twanginess, the sound, you know, the, the filtering doesn't sound quite right, and I'm not talking about the, the actual switchable filtering, I'm talking about the, the standard filtering that is applied to the sound as it goes through on both channels, it sounds a bit odd. Now, it could need a new op amp or two, That's I've not ruled that out, because bear in mind it had its uh, supply rails missing completely. Could that have caused some kind of latch up, or not really latch up, but some sort of failure like that? I don't know. Um, I did test the connectivity previously, but I'm going to revisit that in a minute against uh, a fresh print of the schematics and test every single connection around it. But I thought let's just test it first. Let's just power it back on. It's freezing cold in here today. It's a good test anyway, especially with the uh, dodgy socket we had around the uh, Super Buster there. Uh, also known as the Fat Buster, by the way, in the schematics, it's actually called Fat Buster which uh, is kind of understandable and makes sense because if you think back to the original Agnes that ships on the A1000 that was a dip chip so it's you know long and slender long and thin and uh, when they moved on to the square package and included some of the clock generation stuff on the 500 uh, you know on the uh, 8371 and 8370 that was when it became known as the uh, Fat Agnes and they've done the same thing here Buster originally was a dip IC uh, and then when they put it in a square PLCC fat package, they call it Fat Buster or Super Buster. So let's launch June. I may need to turn the volume up a little bit. It's like getting a lot of bass. Way too much bass there, I don't know. I mean, I've got it quite loud, but I need to because it's raining. That's not right. Yeah, I'm going to check connectivity again. Oh, I wish this rain would go away. I can't hear myself thinking here again. Um, someone pointed out, uh, if you saw part one, I was like, is that cap? Is that supposed to be there? It looks crazy long. Uh, yeah, that is supposed to be there. It's a resettable fuse, apparently. Um, it's got me thinking. I think that's exactly what's inside my ATX power supply, because, uh, as I mentioned in one of my Neo Geo videos there, when I shorted out the rails, the power went off, and then it wouldn't come back on for... I had to leave that power supply off for maybe 20 seconds, and then it powered back up again. So I'm guessing that there's going to be a resettable fuse in there. It's going to be the same thing. That happens every time with that ATX power supply. If you short the rails, power will go off instantly. You can't get it back on for about 20 to 30 seconds. Um, so that's interesting. Um, I think this is the first one of these I've ever seen a resettable fuse on. You know, first Amiga system, I mean. So the next thing I'm going to do is a measure around here. Now, I didn't, I don't know if I showed you this, I might have shown a, a bit of this earlier, but like I printed off the schematics here, you know, so you've got Paula here, and then you've got the uh, filters uh, here, you know, the op amps and things, and the filter section in the middle, <coughs> and the output side over here. I'm going to test every single piece of connectivity. Now, some of this is easy. Um, I'll give you an example, you know, the, the feedback loops, if you can find the uh, that resistor there for example if you measure between this pin on this op amp here and this pin here you're going to measure 750 ohms because there's a 750 ohm there so that means you can rule out that line that line 
that line and that bit there uh, and the bit here so you know you've got a loop just by a measure from here to here do you have 750 ohms uh, and it's the same sort of thing with these here you know you've got two 10ks well it can be fiddly trying to find these because a lot of the time not on the underside of the board but if you measure from this pin here to this pin here you're going to have 20k does that make sense because you've got that so then you can rule that whole chain out there you do of course then need to find i think this is the one thing i didn't do i didn't measure from the middle of these 10k resistors to here it might be we're lacking this on both channels that might be the issue i don't know that one can so i'll just show you this you can see i have been uh, marking these off here but i'll give you an example this one here is uh, pin seven to pin eight and if we measure uh, pin one's down here so you go one two three four five six seven uh eight and nine sorry it's eight and nine i might have just got the pin numbers wrong there it's these end two pins here can you see that 750 ohms so we know that's okay and i've done the same with the ones up here it's the end two pins for the other channel uh for measure there look seven uh hang on 750 ohms so we can rule those out So the next issue here, and we touched upon this in the last video, uh, sorry there's a lag glare, let's just see if we can support that up there a little bit, you can see it a bit better. Um, yeah, it's going to be difficult for me to get in here, but if I just measure from ground to uh, the capacitor here, C404 I think it is, you'll see, hang on if I can get on there that's short or anything, so that 0.4 of a volt, 0.425, that's the voltage reference that should be going into this op and we'll switch it off. It should have two and a half volts there. So sorry if you couldn't see that, but yeah, it was measuring 0.4 volts. So you can see here we've got a voltage divider. We've got the audio uh, plus ground 1K, 1K. So it's 50% of the uh, potential across there. So I think this is plus, this plus odd here, I think it's five volts actually. We'll check that in a minute because I can find uh, those resistors of check the connectivity between them that's okay there is strange readings here when I measure actually um, that was why I came measuring the voltage I thought maybe there's something wrong with the voltage reference but you know it should come across here two and a half volts I think if assuming it's five volts at the top here so it looks like we've got a problem with the bias there that might account for some of the twanginess and the weird sound and I don't think so though um, but you never know um, yeah, so I think you can just about see the meter there. If I just carefully measure, this is R401, it should be 1K, and we're seeing 116, 117 ohms. Could be because it's in circuit, and if we measure R402, again this should be 1K, 86 ohms. So, this is really mysterious. I'm going to use hot air and uh, remove those and just check them out of circuit, but it could be that the resistors have failed there. So apologies, the line's awful in here at the moment. This is R401. Let's take this off first. I mean, it could be that one of these has failed. Um, and then we're going to get strange readings as a result. Because, you know, across the VCC to ground, you do have quite a low resistance in general. And that can confuse matters if one of these has uh, failed. Anyway, hopefully I've got some 1K resistors. I think I probably have. Are they glued down or something? There we go, it's come out. Look. So, so out of interest, let me just uh, measure the other one. Now that one's off there. If I can find it. R402, oh, is that the one? Yeah, it's still showing 80 odd ohms there. R402. Let's just measure the one we just took off. Yeah, the one we just took off is a K. I don't know if you saw that. It is measuring a K. So that's all right. Uh, let's uh, remove the other one. I think that side's molten because it's nice and silvery. This side ain't so much. There we go. I've just like shoved it off. Look, when it over. make sure I don't uh, bridge anything or anything there. Yeah, that's okay. Let's measure this one. Now I've just got this nasty suspicion this one's going to measure all right as well. Where's it gone? I can see it there. Yeah, I've just got this suspicion this one's going to be alright and this is all going to be red herrings and it's going to be nothing to do with these uh, two resistors but it would be nice if it uh, had failed. Yeah, that one's a K as well. Oh, good God. Getting nowhere fast here. So anyway, at least we know 
from that perspective the resistors aren't the issue um, but you can see now what I mean about measuring things in circuit you're probably measuring across the main rails because one's connected to ground the other one's connected to VCC when you start trying to measure them you take into account the resistance between VCC and ground in general for the whole board so that's why they didn't uh, look okay but they are okay but the good news is I can just reinstall those and what we need to check next is the connections from either side you know so one should be connected to ground one should be connected to VCC and then the connections between them to that cap on the other side where I was measuring a minute ago where we saw 0.4 of a volt it's going to be that connection there that's broken perhaps or weak uh, probably one of the wires that's next to it here now if like me you've got limited power points and you're swapping between hot air and a soldering I know a soldering station switching things off and on etc bear in mind with a hot air station like this you see it's ramping down the worst thing you can do with something like this now is just switch it off and go I'm done with that because you can see it ramping down the, the reason why it's a bad idea to switch it off is because this is cooling the element down it's cool, cooling the whole thing down here to get to a, a certain temperature probably 100 degrees before the fan will cut off if you just switch it off this whole element in here is going to be sat there at a higher temperature for a longer period of time the fan is not going to be running so you could cause some damage to it whereby the next time you try and use it the fan doesn't work or you see what I mean it's 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 one of those things but I just thought I'd point it out so I'm gonna have to wait for that to get to 100 degrees wait for the fan to cut off and then plug the solder line in so before I reinstall those uh, resistors I'm just gonna measure on continuity one side of these should connect to well one side of this resistor here should go to ground and you can't see the meter but it's 0, 0.00 so that's correct so the ground side there is a measurement there can you see that but it's coming up 0.64 that's the reading you would get if you measure between ground and VCC you'll see an almost sure it looks low and it can confuse you but it's a zero zero you're looking for so like I said that side there zero zero that side uh, a bit higher um, this one here that's not zero although it's beeping it's not zero it's 0 0.064 that side 0 0.029 now if I measure from one of the VCC connections to this here there we have a short so I know that the 5 volts comes in here to this side of our potential divider 5 volts there and the one down here ground let's just double check that ground on the one on the left yeah that's right so we know we've got 5 volts coming in we've got ground there so the sensors at these two sides join I think and they should join together to that cap on the other side so that's the next thing I need to do but before I do that I'm just going to uh, remove the solder with some desolder braid here and we'll refit those two resistors we're using the um, new one here the uh, Heiko from Dermot Sweeney thank you very much Dermot I've been really enjoying using this iron actually so let's just uh, mop up the solder on that pad and on that one yeah there we go the resistors here by the way and the other ones there I've not uh, took them off the board just left them floating on there while I clean up that's it so I can now uh, just carefully get and there's lots of flux around here which is good because it'll make it really easy to put that back on just get that back into position there I need to centralize it a little bit and I can just get a little bit of uh, solder onto the iron here uh, carefully hold it down Got the wrong tool here. I don't usually use this one, I use the pointy one usually. There we go. And we'll just get a little bit of solder on that side. I need to get in from uh, the other angle. There we go, that's that one done. Uh, let's just slide this one back in. off the extra solder there and we'll just give that a bit of a reflow that's it all done so I'll just clean up with the IPA and cotton buds and then we'll uh, work out where the connection is going bad so now we've got them back on there I thought we'll work out which fire it goes to and it's going to be this one here for measure from this side remember five volts is on this side so this is the center point that joins the resistor here as a dead short uh, and it goes to that via 
and we can do the same measurement here so if we measure from there to there and yeah got the problem just the right spot but we've got a dead short so it's that via there I suspect that's the problem if we measure on the other side we may find we've got no connectivity through that via so I mean I could always just uh, plug that with a piece of kino and you know scratch the surface here scratch the surface on the other side add a little bit of solder and hopefully that might just solve our problem well quite frankly this is hard to believe we've still got 0.4 of a volt so I've got two thoughts this ceramic cap here jump the one here was cracked at a crack in it uh, I'm just wondering if this has failed you know if you measure across it there is a really short resistance could it be that cap I'm going to remove that cap next the only other thing it can be is the op amp pulling that 2.5 volt uh, line low now I've ordered one of these anyway um, I'm going to need to reflow around here because I've had the pins you know probing 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 so much that the just pins just look a bit awful around that op amp anyway um, but I think the next thing I'm going to do is use some wire and just remove this cap. I'm going to get some uh, captain tape around these capacitors here just so I don't melt anything and uh, try and get that off and just see if it's any different without it. So my instincts are telling me it's not going to be this cap. I think it's very unlikely. Although when ceramic caps fail they uh, do short. Um, it's not getting warm but then again there's little current could be drawn through that anyway uh, because of the resistor network there you know so it's not going to get super hot but yeah it could be this we've got to rule it out it will work without it because this is just a uh, bypass cap you know a decoupling cap if this doesn't fix it my targets are firmly on the op amp actually because there's nothing else could be uh, pulling that down unless one of those 1k resistors is measuring as 1k but then um, I don't know, changing its resistance when the bit of current goes through it, I think that's unlikely, to be honest. Even after soldering them back on there, you know, um, they're probably going to be alright. It's not going to be those two 1K resistors. I'm sure I'm going to melt this cap here. It's so close to... Uh, anyway, we've got to rule it out, and this is the easiest way to do it, just remove it and then test it without it. Well, I can remove it and measure it. If it measures as a resistance, then uh, I'll swap it out before we test it. Bear in mind when you're doing hot air rework like this, you, you really want some clearance from the board. You know, this board should not be sat on the mat here because the heat's going to dissipate through the other side. There we go, just slide it out of the way. There we go. Uh, right, that's that done. I'm just going to measure that cap now, actually. Now, it might not prove anything because uh, it's heated up, you know, so... It, uh, if it was a resistor, it's, it might not, no longer be a resistor. Oh my god, it's a resistor. There we go. Uh, it took a while to work that one out. I'll show you on the meter. So all those times you thought uh, when you were looking at ceramic caps, it can't be the ceramic cap. Look at that, 72 ohms. So, uh, yeah, there we go. We finally got to the bottom of it, I think. So just looking at the schematics again handily that's uh, 0.22 microfarad and we got a load of those because we replaced the one that was cracked down here. I'm wondering if that went the same way as this one actually that's what that crack was. Um, I might just have a look around the board to see if there's any more of these of this brand of that size because it's, it could be a common thing we might have in fact I can see one or two I think we might have uh, one or two of these failed in other places um, anyway we'll swap that out with the brand new 0.22 it's not as large as that one it's going to be the same as this one down here can you see that the one we fitted there you know but it's the same in capacitance and voltage rating so following on from part one um, discussions in the comments there you know because I, I did ask the question what do you think about ceramic caps and uh, to be fair lots of them were tantalums on here now tantalums there's nothing really wrong with tantalums but tantalums can short just the same as this they short uh, often they'll blast the tops off but I've seen tantalums fail and uh, just short and it's the same with ceramics I think Chucky posted a comment saying ceramics short and you know what people perhaps didn't believe him here you go that's a ceramic cap, shorted. Now, you might think, well, so what? What's the big deal? Well, when they're across the supply rails, they're perhaps going to have a little bit more stress than they would be in other parts of the circuit. Um, well, that's my 
my own honest opinion you know one that's just on a filter part of a filter for an op amp it's not going to get very much in the way of stress but one that's across the 5 volt rail or a 12 volt rail minus 12 it is um, let's say it does short you may think well I'm no worse off than I had if I had a wet type electrolytic that would leak you know because that's going to cause some leakage but you know what the leakage does not happen instantly um, it could be 20 years before these leak the other thing is it doesn't damage instantly either somebody who's uh, in love with a system like this is going to be in and out of there every six to twelve months or every few years give it a check and you're going to see you're going to see some discoloration you're going to see little bits of liquid or something on there and you're going to be able to deal with it before it's a problem but when a ceramic cap shorts like that if it's one of the ones on the supply rail the next thing you know your system's not powering up but it goes beyond that if your 5 volt shorts out and one of the rails doesn't you could get some latch up problems somewhere you know depending on where it is in the circuit you could get a latch up failure it could kill one of the ICs uh, through whole electro and, and uh, SMD electrolytics like this uh, wet types aren't going to short so in my mind this is another me a good reason to put this type of cap on here do you really want to risk some sort of future failure from a tantalum or from a ceramic where by you get a failure and you get latch up yeah you might just have one cap and you fix that cap suddenly you find you've got a problem one of your chips has died somewhere because of that short um, it's totally possible anyway that's just my view some people like to put the uh, SMD wet types like this on there just to make it look like it originally shipped really you know try and keep it looking the same way it uh, came from Commodore but anyway, I'll let you uh, argue <laughs> in the comments below. I'm sure lots of people are going to disagree with me because there are lots of people on PC engines and Amiga motherboards swapping these out for tantalums and uh, ceramics. I think a tantalum's probably much less of a risk. Well, having said that, I think tantalums tend to short more than ceramics, to be honest. So I don't know. Anyway, we'll get a little bit of sold on there. I'll refloat with some flux in a minute. Um, the way I've been speeding up this, instead of holding it down, is just literally blob into it like that and then hold it down because you can kind of position it perfectly yeah that's not so bad let's just get a little bit of solder is it on yeah it is a little bit of solder on this side coming in at a weird angle here and a lot more solder on that side just get a little bit of flux on there Yeah, so that's 0.22 microfarad, 220 nanofarad. Let's just come in at this angle here. Got a weird shape on that solder there. Yeah, that's not so bad. So we'll just clean that up and let's go and test it again. Measure the voltage there and hopefully, fingers crossed, well, I don't see why not. We should have 2.5 volts there now. And I'm hoping that the uh, twanginess, if anything, has gone. If I just measure between, uh, I'll use one of the ground pads down here, and that 4.7 microfarad cap there, look at that, 2.4 volts. I mean, it's a bit low, but you know, that's that's right. Because okay, the connectivity there is a short, so that has fixed that. Let's test June again. I'm just curious to listen to it and see if it sounds any different, really. Yes! Can you hear that? I've got the wind back. Wow, I would never believed that that DC offset bias there would be the issue. I wonder if it sounds twangy. No, it doesn't. That's a kind of bassy noise instead of a twang. Fantastic. That means we're pretty much there. I think this Amiga's. Uh, back to good health. Let's test the Aladdin now because I'm also curious to see if the uh, sound on the Aladdin is normal. That's brilliant, fantastic. Now let's just test um, Aladdin because I'm curious with this one. I didn't show you the before shot, but the, the voice part of it was just like breaking up. But you know what? The rest of it sounded normal. Many of the games sounded totally normal. You would have no clue that there was an issue there with that cap for sure. It's the singing bit that was wrong here. Everything else sounded normal. Mm. 
turn up a little bit. I had an artifact there I didn't like. It was like a car horn. Fantastic, it's made my Christmas getting this right. And before I forget, the other thing with pointing out is it's not just going to be affecting the filtering when that V-Ref is low. Obviously you're going to be clipping on the uh, caps as well, you know. You're going to have a negative, large negative, or larger negative sweeps going through those caps. So, you know, that could speed up their demise when they're polarised. But I am just so pleased to have got that working. And you might be wondering, why do I always uh, test with the same games, you know, like June? I've used June a fair bit. It's because I know how it sounds. Um, now, there is a subtle difference between how it sounds on a, a 1200 and a 4000 versus, say, a 500 or a 2000, because you do have an extra Butterworth filter there um, to give you some additional filtering. Yeah, it was just coming to me touching that when it looped the demo there. I didn't make it crash or anything. Um, so yeah, I always use the same games generally because I know what to expect. I know exactly, precisely how they are supposed to sound. So before I clean this up, one final thing I'll point out. You saw me scope it earlier and the triangle wave looked like a triangle. Both channels were the same. The sine wave looked like a sine wave. A square wave looked like a square wave. So, you know, you can't always use things like that either to assist you. I was convinced it was not to do with the filter because we proved just using sys test filter on you know with the high frequency there you could hear it cutting it off properly on both channels so uh, it had to be either connectivity around there or we knew that the bias was low because I don't think you saw in part one we measured this and I was like that's not right 0.4 of a volt I was uh, you know and I forgot about that I then went on and did all the other stuff around there then it still wasn't right and I came back to thinking about the bias it was the only thing that remained all connectivity was there it had to be the bias um, the other thing that did cross my mind like the ceramic cap here shorted there were, the, there's a couple of other caps around the uh, op amp there I wondered if they'd shorted that would have been the next thing had that had we not had a problem with the bias here and everything was okay connectivity wise that would have been my next thought I would have been looking well I probably would have swapped out the op amp first actually because that would have been the most logical thing to do but if I still had the issue the next thing would be to check the other ceramic caps around that part of the circuit the resistors they're easy to measure you know I've measured all those this like a bunch of 10k's and 4k 7's they're all fine everything measures fine with regards to connectivity there um, but ceramics, as you've seen, can fail. So we're on to the home run. So it's just a final clean-up work now, uh, reassembly and testing. So I don't know if you can see, can you see the points on here? I'll just get you a bit closer. Yeah, look at that, that's awful. That has been reflowed or replaced by somebody and it's just really messy. So I'll reflow this chip now to get a bit of flux on there, on both sides. I'm not going to drag over these, I'm going to dab in and out. Just got to want to make sure they've had sufficient time on each pin to get rid of any uh, crustiness there. So just cleaning up on both sides, you can see here it's uh, particularly dirty in this corner. Um, yeah, any marks like this, I'm just going to spend some time cleaning off. I'll use the toothbrush where required and uh, fiberglass pen on any of these uh, mounts here that just look a bit corroded. But hopefully you can see that it's starting to come up a bit cleaner. It's going to need a few different cotton buds that. It's particularly dirty that bit. And there we go, that's afterwards, you can see I've cleaned up uh, all around there. 
So whilst technically it doesn't really need it, I'm going to give uh, the underneath of the audio part another clean here. You know, this has all been cleaned a number of times. We've had a few components off here, a couple of 1K resistors. Uh, there was one that was faulty, wasn't that? 1 ohm that meant the, uh, I think it was the minus 12 went low. It was like around 10 volts, I think, wasn't it? All the tops of these components here have all been cleaned with the uh, fiberglass uh, pen as well because they were all uh, all the, the, the metal contacts on them were all like, dull and dark you can see the uh, control ports here so I mean it's all looking pretty tidy and of course the first thing I did was with vinegar you know all this around here has been cleaned with vinegar so one thing I would say is that you know there's the odd exposed pad but uh, I'm pretty confident there is no corrosion remaining on here so even though that there is the odd little bit of copper exposed, it'll be okay. My uh, personal view is if this, one, this was my own, I'd get some clear nail varnish and cover over those little bits of copper. Chris can do that himself if he wants to. Um, I don't want to do it to his board because it's kind of one of those things that makes a bit of a mess, you know. It doesn't look cosmetically as nice. Uh, I'm sure it will be okay without it because I have managed to get most of the corrosion off this, if not all. You know, I could spend time with the dragging the solder braid across this area here and uh, trying to tin up some of those bits there, but it's just going to start to look a mess. And the connectivity around there is okay. You know, it might look a mess, but it is okay. And this has been cleaned and cleaned and cleaned. It really has. I must have cleaned this myself with both vinegar and IPA a good. 10 times I think as part of uh, you know doing work on other areas around here so I don't think there's anything to worry about I think if something was, was going to break around there it would have uh, given up the ghost a long time ago we did reflow the connections on Paul and uh, earlier on because those were really dirty actually but in terms of traces and wires and things around here I'm confident that this will uh, live to see another day or well many days hopefully now I've reflowed one or two of the odd points on these pals here, but you know they just look crusty as anything. There's not a lot you can do with that, um, you know, because it's the pads are not great. The pins have had bits of solder strewn up the sides of them. Whoever did the uh, solder work on there previously, um, the pins on there look a little bit dull, but it's okay. So uh, you know, it's like where do you draw the line? I could reflow that, reflow that, um, reflow these two because those that side of that one's been done because it was super corroded. But the other sides are okay. Um, yeah, so it's like where do you draw the line? You could remove all the components here and clean up the PCB and then reintroduce things and replace components that are a little bit corroded. But I, I kid you not, I must have spent oh, I don't know 40, 50 hours on this, maybe even more. It's ridiculous the amount of time you have to spend on one of these if you want to do a, 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 you know, a really, really thorough job. Um, so other than the uh, bodge there, you know, we've got a piece of kynar on either side of that to support that cap on, and a little a, a drip, literally a drip of super glue underneath its base just to hold it in place. Every other cap was swapped out okay. We did have to uh, trail a little piece of kynar there. Can you see that to that cap? One thing I would point out is, as part of inspection of this, can you see there's like a plastic lip on the bottom and somebody's previously broken that plastic lip off, it's like pressed down. Can you see on this side here, see it's raised up a bit, and as you go on, can you see, look, it goes flat. It's the same on the one on the other side, so I'm not sure what's happened to that. The other thing I would point out is the corrosion we saw on the uh, first part around here. I was like, where on earth did that come from? It's probably come from the CPU card, because this has obviously got a you know a third party one that was designed by Chucky. Um, so the one that was on there was probably super corroded, and the corrosion probably kind of, kind of ran down the side of here. Um, now I have cleaned the uh, contacts here, the gold plated, but you know it's got a little bit of vinegar in there, toothbrush, and IPA, just to make sure that that's clean. But I think we're okay now. The board in general is looking, I think, super tidy. The final thing I'm going to do is just swap out the two through hole caps, there's one here and one up the other side, because those are the only ones I've still got that haven't been replaced out of the cap kit. Um, you can see this here, I just flattened this down, I think that's how it was intended to be mounted, just over the top of those downs. And do you remember the extended bits of the legs here that was cracked? The thing, there was like little pieces of the yellow stuff hanging on there, I just snipped those off, just to make it look tidy. You can see it looks nice and uh, tidy around there. And uh, I've removed any of the corrosion off any of the SMD components around there as well. So we're up to 450, let's uh, give that a go. 
I can feel straight away that that's uh, the solder's melting a lot easier there. Yeah, look at that, solders will come off there. So there we go, 450 with this uh, Heiko is just the ticket. It's probably going to be hanging on a little bit. Might need to just uh, touch the yeah, points there. There's still a bit of solder, look. This is the thing, it can look free and it isn't. I'm just going to pull it through and then we'll just unblock the holes. Be very careful, you don't want to uh, pull the pads off and stuff on the other side. There we go. Yeah, this Heiko is making uh, light work of this, actually. I would have probably struggled a little bit more with my uh, 15 watt iron if I'd uh, tried to uh, do that. There we go. So let's just get this on. These legs on this are a bit short because I've been using these legs for other things actually. So let's get that like that. I'm just going to test the uh, ground in relation to ground to make sure I've got the right uh, orientation there. So I've just uh, flipped that over. It's nice and flush. So the negative is on the left hand side there of that cap. Uh, I'm just going to test from her ground down here. Yeah, there we go. Yeah, that side's got a resistance. That side's a dead short. Bear in mind that's not always a 100% uh, accurate way of checking that the ground is on the right side. Uh, you know, if it's a coupling cap, it's going to be different because it's not going to have ground on the other side. If it's, um, but if it's a smoothing cap like that, in general it will be if it's on a positive rail. But the exception is if this was on the say the minus five or the minus twelve, you might find the orientation is the other way. You know, you might expect it to be. Uh, the way it is now and it could be the other way but yeah I'm sure that that's correct because there was a positive designation there um, I wasn't really paying attention when I looked at the old cap I should have just checked to see which way the old cap was soldered on there so let's uh, just trim trim those off the other thing I'll typically do when I've got uh, quite wide blobs of solder like that is after I've uh, trimmed the legs off is uh, just reflow it again like that. You just get cleaner points on there. So something else to point out, it's a Rev B board this, it's not the cost reduced one I don't think. From what I understand the cost reduced one, and this was uh, some of the comments in the previous video, someone was telling me that the chip ram is on board. Now I was aware there was one of these revisions with the chip ram on board, you know the chips are soldered on board instead of being a, a sim. Um, but that's one of the things on the cost reduced. But I think on the cost reduced one, you've got 68020 on there, or something like that. There's a jump here for the 68020. You see that? Now, I put a jumper on there, um, just on the single pin. It doesn't need to be there. I could just remove that, because you can't actually use one. You need to have a, a PAL here, I think, and then you'd need, obviously, a specific CPU card that uses a 68020. So that's interesting as well. And the other thing that might just relate to the Rev B is I think someone was saying these sockets are around the wrong way. So typically you might want to swap the red one to the, that side there and the white one over there. I'm not going to do that. I'm just going to leave that as it is because it's as it's shipped. Um, Chris could always do that if he wants. Um, I'm inclined to leave things the way they were unless there's something fundamentally wrong with it. So I've got one cap to swap out there and then I think we are done pretty much. Yeah, it smelt a bit fishy under there. I suspect it was the cap here that leaked to this area, but can you say that pad's a little bit uh, dark grey there? So yeah, some clean up of that is required. I'll get a little bit of vinegar on there in a sec, I think. But it was worth swapping those out while I was there. Yeah, I don't think I need any vinegar on that there because it's such a small uh, area, that pad. You can see that's looking very clean now. So let's get the cap on there. Because I've been probing it a lot, uh, I wanted to reflow the pins on that chip there because it was just looking a mess. Now, I've tried using the uh, Heiko. I need to change the tip on this. Can you see it's like a conical one? Um, and you get little bits of blobs of solder on the end. So this is the interesting thing because I've always only, well, for the last uh, 20 or 30 years, only ever used uh, this soldering iron with a, you know, it's got a slanted edge like that. Uh, I'm just going to just temporarily swap back to that. But I think what I'll do ultimately is swap the tip on the Heiko for the same type of tip but something smaller because despite how crusty this is I can do a better job with this iron uh, surprisingly on solder points like that uh, there uh, I need to be careful because I don't want to melt the uh, connector here we'll do th that side off camera but if I just get uh, a little bit of solder 
onto there and um, we'll just reflow uh, this side here let's get some more flux on there making a spectacular mess of that now I managed to bridge a few pins there yeah the key is the flux um, I see I've seen uh, I watched a few uh, videos on uh, my mate Vince's channel actually it's a really good channel you should check out uh, now he tried uh, doing some drag flowing recently and struggled a little bit and the flux is the key uh, now it's not the case he wasn't using flux it's the type of flux he was using that was the problem there if you use just chip this chip quick flux makes super light work of something like that and you can see that that reflowed really really well so we'll try an approach from this uh, side here and again I'm just gonna just do a drag carefully carefully there we go just that first pin looks a bit weird that's it it's looking tidy so a quick waffle about the chips on here so super buster I need to clean the top of that actually it's got a bit of flux on there can you see that uh, I'll clean that in a minute but uh, yeah we fitted a Rev 11 super buster on here the Rev 9 brought in DMA because I think the uh, prior revision it might be Rev 1 I'm not sure uh, lacked the DMA or had uh, something wrong with DMA that meant it didn't work properly but uh, Rev 11 fixes the bug um, related to the Rev 9 uh, DMA actually uh, and I think if you fitted this, you needed to have a 25 megahertz uh, 030. You couldn't just use 16 megahertz uh, for whatever reason. Over this side here, just next to the uh, IDE and uh, floppy connector, you've got uh, Fat Gary. So again, it's fat because it's a square package. But also, I think the the main change to this is to support 32 bit. You know, because the original Gary was a 16 bit IC. You've got Alice down here, which I believe was kind of like the 32-bit, uh, you know, the AGA version of Agnes. So memory control and stuff is, uh, and probably your clock generation comes from here. Um, and obviously it's 32-bit, you know, for the AGA stuff. Paula uh, is here, the PLCC version. I'm surprised they didn't call it Fat Paula, <laughs> to be fair. Um, that's the uh, DAC, the video DAC. You can see the solder has been reflowed around there previously. That looks like that's been done at a different point in time to the other stuff, if I'm honest. And then you've got Lisa, which is the AGA version of the, uh, well, Denise, you know, graphics I see there. And like on all Amigas, you've got a couple of CAAs here. So again, it's the PLCC version of those. I don't think there's any other change uh, to those. I think you could probably have an adapter socket and fit a dip one. Well, you'd be a bit crazy to try and fit a dip one on here, but you could do the opposite thing. You could take one of these, stick it on an adapter board and stick it into a 500 or something like that and it would work okay. But it's going to be the same, uh, these are the same uh, chips you get on a 600 or a 1200. And the one I'm not clued up on at all is Ramsey, so uh, bear with me, I'm just going to go and hit Wikipedia. Yeah, apparently Ramsey is used for the onboard fast RAM, so, you know, the SIM slots here. So, contrary to what we're saying about memory control being done by uh, Alice, well, it does, it does some of the address decoding for memory and stuff like that. But I think this is, uh, this, but I think this was implemented for the uh, additional RAM that this system can support. And then finally, you've got Bridget here, which uh, is, as it sounds, a bridge. It bridges the chip, I/O, and uh, buses. I think you know. So for the interface stuff, perhaps you know, for the cards. Um, effectively, that replaces a bunch of seven four F six four sixes. I think, kind of a bit neo buffish, um, but on a grander scale. I think. So yeah, I think we're good to go now. It's looking as tidy as it's going to get. Let's get it back into the case and uh, reassemble and test. So before I just uh, stick the board back in here, one thing I'm going to do is just clean that piece of plastic. But also, can you see these screw mounts? Where the corrosion has uh, leaked from the board and stuff, it's uh, gone onto the uh, chassis here. So uh, I'm just going to clean up these with the uh, fiberglass pen here. I might use the wire brush if it's not coming off. It seems to be coming off though, as you can see. And there we go, it's looking sweet. So I'll just uh, wipe that with some IPA. Look how much better that is now. So I've cleaned that one as well. 
what this one needs doing. Look how ready, uh, dark, dull grey that is. It's uh, all where the uh, caps and the battery have been actually on that side of the board. So I've wiped the inside of that thoroughly. Uh, I'm just going to clean this piece of plastic that uh, goes on the underside there as an isolator. Look that's pretty dirty. So the one thing I would say about this is this is that kind of plastic that when you rub it you get static electricity so make sure your earth is uh, you know your case is earthed uh, before you attempt to install this you know after you've cleaned it I'm not sure which way around it goes and goes that way uh, and just keep touching the uh, chassis to make sure you're dissipating uh, any static that may have built up actually you know I'm not really sure you could discharge a plastic sheet like that because I could tell you know it was attracting hairs and things like that so I've had to spend a while just making sure that that's clean but just pay extra close attention to make sure you're wearing an ESD wrist strap and that you know you, if anything you're touching the chassis like this because this is uh, the chassis. So let's get the uh, motherboard back into position if we can. Uh, the easy way to do that is hold this uh, power wire out of the way any of the wires and things and just try and slide it in making sure that port goes in first at the back there and that the no wires or anything are snagging uh, and then just kind of like lower it down is that in no it's not quite in is it let's try that again yeah there we go that's in now so before i commit to completely uh, reassembling it i'm just going to put a single screw as i did earlier in the motherboard center here you've got to sort of push the slot up a little bit away from the back in order that that screw goes in nice and straight like that doesn't need to be super tight at this stage that'll do and just start connecting everything back up really let's uh, connect the power first uh, the IDE uh, compact flash uh, you can see I've been using a compact flash adapter here you know this is just a cheap uh, IDE to compact flash adapter you've got to provide it power so for the moment I've had the power coming from the floppy connector there do make sure that that is correctly aligned uh, before you uh, is that on? Yeah, before you plug that in, you wouldn't want to misalign it and just have it on one row, or you know, misalign it to the sides. You could damage uh, something uh, on here. So uh, we'll just uh, finish spot cleaning this because I got most of the flux off it previously. I used the toothbrush and give it a really good scrub down. You can see there's a bit of uh, tissue or something there. Uh, but for the most part, I think I got that looking pretty good. There was a bit of flux on here. Look, still. I'm not sure how someone's managed to get flux onto the top of that. That takes some uh, some effort to try and uh, get flux on there, to be honest. There you go, that's looking a lot cleaner. Um, there's little bits of glue, they've used glue here to support these pillars, you know, they're still a little bit loose, but I did reheat that glue with a bit of hot air just to uh, try and make a better grip on those, but I think you'll agree that is much cleaner than it was when it came to me. Something I thought I'd point out as well is on the um, cost reduced 4000 motherboard, the 020 that I mentioned you get on the board, you don't, you get an 030 soldered on onto the cost reduced uh, 4000. So let's get that back into uh, position. It can be a bit fiddly because you've got to be looking down from the right hand side here to see where the edge of the uh, socket is actually. Is that right? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. And then just uh, press down. There's a little bit of uh, tissue there. Let's just get rid of that. Um, yeah, just make sure it's firmly in place there. So I've got the RAM back in there. Uh, I showed you how to uh, fit those in earlier. One thing I will say, I'm going to remove these before I send it back to Chris. He'll need to reinstall the RAM. It's worth him going in here anyway, just to make sure that this CPU board is in, down, flat and flush as far as it possibly can be. Sweet. Oh yes.
so now we're at that stage where I want to get this back in and I think I'm going to connect a Zorro 2 card up because this should support both Zorro 2 and Zorro 3. Um, just looking at things, these look like the Zorro uh, 2 connectors and I think this is the Zorro 3 bit here, it's like a small bit and a longer bit, kind of like uh, PC uh, slots actually. Although, just looking at things here, can you see this? This one at the bottom here is different. Why is this different? Is this for a video card maybe? I don't know, that's got me a little bit concerned, but anyway, I'll uh, research that before I do anything. So I've not been able to test the Zorro slots there properly. It does detect my uh, RAM module on the 2091, uh, sorry, 2090. Um, if I have enabled SCSI, it doesn't boot. You need a SCSI uh, device connected to those things, or at least some termination. Uh, or it just sits there forever and a day. Um, with the RAM side, it's 50% of the time it detects it okay, the other 50% of the time it says it's defective. Um, so that could indicate there's something going on with the uh, slots here. I don't think so. The only thing that could be relevant is the pins in this corner of uh, Superbuster here. Now, I did reflow as much as I could around there. So one or two of the screws, as you can see, uh, are awful. So uh, I'm taking an opportunity to clean these up with the wire brush now, actually. Uh, and then I'll just wipe over them uh, with some vinegar. Uh, and then a bit of WD-40, I think, just on the end of it. The next thing I need to do is uh, get the uh, hex nuts onto this port here. Uh, and get the uh, bay back in here, you know, for the slots, cards. So we'll, uh, yeah, not tighten those too tight, because you can easily uh, break the, you know, the, the nut is supported on the inside down the plastic of the housing of the socket. It can uh, break if you do these too tight. So the next thing to do is to get this, and it goes from the inside here. This bit goes through there like that, and then we've just got a screw here. And the next thing that needs to go in place is uh, this supporting uh, bracket here. Got to get this the right way to hold the uh, thing properly. I think that's correct, actually. Let's just try it the other way. Yeah, that would be the wrong way. It's this way. Now, I've got no idea which screws are which here, because there's loads of them that are subtly different. But I've got two like this that have got quite large uh, tops. I'm guessing those are what went in here. Let's just see if it's got the right thread. Yeah, it does. Oh, I've dropped that one on the board. Yeah, there we go. So the next thing we need to do is connect up the floppy drive. The easy way to do that is uh, to connect it up outside of the case. Uh, so pin one is uh, down here. That's where the red line wants to go. Uh, so it wants to go this way up here. Let's see if we can get that on properly. That's it. It's got the keyed bit there, so you can't get that around wrong anyway. It's just easier to connect this up now rather than later and the floppy drive power is not going to reach while I've got the compact flash uh, interface connected there so uh, I can deal with that later. So it's going dark uh, but just looking at the back of this it's scuzzy. This is a scuzzy driver. I was looking for the master slave jumpers there aren't any. It's uh, ID and termination resistor and then I realised it's scuzzy. So uh, yeah it's not going to get that working in here without a scuzzy interface. There you go. You know you've got it just the right spot because everything marries up. Yeah, we've got a little bit of speech there. Got some enemies coming from the right there. Somewhere. Ah, oh, the wrong person. Anyway, it's been ages since I played this. The 3DO version of this is pretty good, actually. Sweet, that's working. Yeah, nothing beats the uh, C64 version, that's for sure. Got a lot of help, funny. There we go. Forgot what that does. I think that opens a trap door somewhere. Does it? Lure of the Temptress. I think this is another point and click. So yeah, this is another point and click. I do like my point and clicks. I think what you've got to do here is uh, mess with the candle or something there and set the, or the torch and set the uh, thing on fire. And then he becomes preoccupied with the fire 
and you can uh, exit and lock him in. Our type by factor 5. Sounded sweet. It's annoying I couldn't get the A2090 working properly, but I think that's going to be a consequence of the 06 hour, if I'm honest. So the final thing is to get the uh, power bar through here onto there so that we can uh, switch it off and on like that. Anyway, I'll change out the hard disk, we'll just make sure the hard disk is booting. I think the reason the hard disk was playing up earlier in part one is because of the Super Buster. You know, we had some really bad crusty connections around there as you saw in this video. And uh, that would stop it from, you know, just do a black screen and stuff. And I think that ultimately that was why he was getting the black screen. And I think a consequence of pressing round here, you know, you're putting a bit of tension on this area of the board here. It was maybe because the connections were bad up here particularly. It was probably that that's caused it, you know. And there's a number of things here, you know, the battery. The battery's going to cause some damage. The caps will have caused some damage. The caps have leaked and caused damage in a number of places. They didn't do over this side. On the right-hand side here, the caps seem to have been okay. The issue really seems to have been the uh, battery and the audio section up here. So I'd like to give a special thanks to SuperDuper because he's uh, lent me this uh, compact flash card to uh, assist with this video. So without SuperDuper's help, I would not have been able to uh, test all these games on this easily. Because one of the things with the, this system, there's no PCMCA slot like you get on the 1200. So on the 1200, you can get a, a compact flash to PCMCA adapter, stick it in the side of your 1200, and transfer the files to and from the PC via the compact flash card. Um, now the compact flash cards I've got will not boot on this machine because of the 060. It needs a specific uh, setup in order to work. So yeah, thank you uh, SuperDuper. The other reason I mentioned SuperDuper, if you saw the live stream, I'll stick a link to it uh, up there if I haven't already, um, of testing this system that I did last night. Um, the giveaway there, the TF330, you know, an accelerator card there for the CD32, that was thanks to SuperDuper. Uh, and I forgot to mention uh, that in the video, and it was super important really. So yeah, I'm a bit embarrassed about that. but. Uh, yeah, nevertheless, mentioned in this video. Go and, if you want um, a CD32 accelerator, go and check out uh, the link down below on Amibay and speak to SuperDuper. He's your guy. He assembles fantastic um, expansions for the CD32. So the hard drive, uh, again, is missing some screws. Let me just go see if I can find some. Can you see here we've got a mismatch? You've got a square, uh, you know, a crosshead, and a flat, and a flat. So we've got a mismatch there and it's not held in entirely. So I'll go and find a set of those, but then this needs to sit here like this and then uh, obviously uh, plug into the uh, IDE thing down there. Probably the best way of doing this is to use this short bit here to connect it down below so that you've got a longer cable coming off to your IDE, uh, you know, your second hard drive or your CD-ROM 
etc. I've left the jumper set on master on here and it boots okay. So all Chris, you know, Cathers needs to do if he wants to add a CD, I would personally get rid of the SCSI drive and get an IDE CD-ROM and, uh, you know, obviously just connect it up uh, to the longer thing there, you know, just replace the one that's in. So I've got a ton of uh, screws here from when I was in the trade. You can see these are all PC, uh, generic uh, motherboard screws and stuff and ones for drives. So I've removed the crusty screw that was there. This one's got a bit of thread lock on top actually, but it is the right kind of screws. You can see that's going in perfectly. So I'll replace uh, all four of the screws here so that it's got proper screws to hold the hard disk in. Uh, and I might just temporarily remove the CD-ROM drive because I notice that's only screwed in on one side. So I'll do the same thing there. I'll give him some new screws to hold the CD-ROM in there. And then when he swaps it out for uh, an IDE one or something later, it's not quite in there, is it? He can... Uh, Let's just make sure it's not too long. Yeah, you've always got to check on these, because if you screw them too long, they could go into the PCB, but you can see there's like a recess there. It's only a small thing, but, you know, it's um, a nice machine. So uh, why not make it look nice and tidy, I guess. I'm trying to avoid touching the underside of the drive while I'm doing this, because I'm not wearing the ESD wrist strap just now. Should be doing. Um, there we go, so that can go back in. So hopefully you can just about see, you can see those screws, they've got like a, a hex sort of thing to the top, but it's a cross head. So I've got uh, two more of those for the other side. The other thing I'm changing here is these screws were not right, can you see the difference? These were the ones that were holding that in there, so they're crazy. Now there were two of these that are identical, that were holding the uh, one of the drives in. Uh, and I think these are the screws that should go through here, because they're the exact length, can you see that? That is the exact right length. If it was uh, that long, it sticks out the back there by uh, way too far. I'm pretty sure that is the screws, or those were the screws that should be there. So let's now test that and see what happens. I've got a floppy in the drive there. I don't know whether the floppy drive is connected up properly. Let's see. Oh, it is. It's built from floppy. That's great. So, a memory 16 meg fast to my chip that's all okay so I'll eject the floppy and let's boot from uh, the hard disk yeah look at that super fast booting actually I'm amazed so yeah everything is working fine there you can see there's tons of apps on here this is the issue, this is why I needed that compact flash card from SuperDuper because there's nothing remotely sound related. You've got UFO, that's the only game on the hard disk here. That's just like the OS stuff here. And there are a few programs as well. Yeah, no games at all. I'm amazed at someone, uh, mind you, it's a performance machine, isn't it? So someone's been doing a lot of uh, productivity stuff on here. There are other obvious things you might want to do while you're inside a machine like this. You might want to inspect and recap uh, the power supply. And you might want to service and lubricate the uh, floppy drive as well, you know. There's a number of things you could do in there. But I've got to draw the line somewhere. If I spend all the time doing that as well, I'll be at this for another two weeks. And Time is money. Um, but not only that, the floppy drive is working. And I suspect the power supply is going to be all right. You know, you might want to, as a precaution, recap it. But I'd be amazed if 10 years from now that power supply is not working still really super well on the caps that are in there now. Um, but it's uh, something to consider. So something else I want to show you, and I noticed this when the bay was out, because this bay has been set out of the machine for a week or two, it was upside down. And I noticed this LED here, can you see it's bent? And uh, it's not lined up with a hole. So you just uh, push the little clip there, can you see that? And the one on the other side, just in a little bit and you can pull the front off. But what we can do now is just bend this LED downwards and upwards a little bit like that. And we're gonna need a bit of experimentation now to get it uh, totally lined up with the slot. But the gap, you know, the, the, but the width of that there should fit into that hole if you get it just right. Uh, I'm not sure what's happened to it in the past. It's had a knock or something. Presumed from the underside, but if we just try and uh, get that back on, we'll just see if we can get it in position. The other thing I could just do now is just bend it towards uh, a little bit. So if we, so if we look at it there and then just. 
Oh shit, there you go, can you see that? Yeah, I'm not sure if I caught that. Just pushing it from the back end of the LED, can you see? It's extended, you know, it's protruding a tiny little bit as it should be. So that's had a knock at some point, but anyway, it's sorted now. So just a quick final summary on the voltages around the audio circuit. If you've got audio problems on your 4000, this is what you want to do. You want to measure the centre pin down there, so that might, that, that's plus 12. The centre pin on the opposite side of the op amp, minus 12, you see that? And the bias, now the easy way to the bias is this 4.7 microfarad cap here, it's left hand side should be 2.3. 5 volts and I think I forget which side it is let's just try that one there can you see that bit pin 1 as well measure pin 1 you know the first pin in this corner here on that op amp and you should see roughly 2.5 volts um, on the op amp at the end there it's top uh, right pin you know nearest the uh, edge of the case there 12 volts and on the side nearest the edge of the case here the pin that's nearest to me now pin 4 you can see minus 12 so you want to do those measurements there if you're get, not getting any audio on a 4000 but ultimately it's going to be the caps you'll need to replace the caps but if you've done all that and you're still not getting sound obviously measure those voltages yeah i think this thing here is a key lock actually it's not to lock the lid on i think it's a key lock because it's a, a switch you know it's not like a some pc cases used to have like a physical uh, you know a lever a metal lever on that when you turned it it slid one way or the other and it, it, it locked into the case somehow to stop you taking the lid off but that's not the case so it looks like a key lock to me it probably stops the keyboard from working um anyway we'll connect that back up i'm going to go see if i've got any keys that might fit that because I, I suspect i may have a key for that if he's not got one so I've connected those up and there's little gaps here you can see for the wires. You need to pull them out a little bit, you know, so that they're just uh, in the right place there. And I suspect that'll be okay. And then uh, gently uh, clip this back on. Like that. You can see the uh, floppy drive is getting snagged. There we go, a little bit by that. You need to be careful with this though because it's yellowed plastic it could break super easily uh, just make sure that's all on very little force was needed to unclip those but be very careful when you're clipping and unclipping that for sure i think that's okay yeah that's on that's on yeah here we go here are my miscellaneous uh, drawers here you can see i've got a load of keys these may or may not fit yeah you see that one's not going to fit is it let's try uh, another one well, would you believe it? I have found a key <laughs> that fits. Fantastic. Let's just try the other one. Uh, what I'll do is I'll keep one of these myself and uh, give him the other one. So he's got a key for it. But that works. So finally we are done and we can uh, get the lid on here. Just being uh, careful not to trap any wires and things, but yeah, that's it. Just needs uh, screwing on from the back now. Oh, nothing's ever straightforward, is it? This has been manhandled in the past. Can you see? That's bent out. Whereas if you look at that one, that one's okay. And if you look down here, can you see this is stuck outwards a bit? And this one isn't. So put a matching set of uh, brand new screws on the back on both sides because all the screws on this, all the ones certainly for the exterior and some of the interior mounts and things, they're all mismatched. When this has been repaired, someone's bodged the wrong screws in from other places. They probably lost half the original ones. So it's had a quick wipe this on uh, the three sides, well, the two sides and the top here. It's come out a lot better, but there are some marks on the top which won't come off, and one or two on the sides. But you can see, you know, there's dirt coming off that. It's dirt. Um, I started with a bit of IPA to try and get some of the marks off, and then just used some. Uh, Soapy water here just to uh, wipe over that afterwards The other reason to mention super duper can you see this keyboard adapter here? I'm using a, an IBM PS slash 2 Keyboard plugged into that little adapter there into the 4000 those will work with the CD 32 or an Amiga 4000 So uh, yeah, thanks again to mark, you know super duper there much appreciated It's been a lifesaver helping me test this 4000 uh, before I forget, here's the uh, case. So this was one of the brand new Kickstarter campaign cases for the 1200. I think this one is just the cream white. 
Uh, I was hoping it's going to be a transparent. Uh, in fact, it's whiter than white, that actually. It's better than the uh, the one I've got, for sure. So it's really nice, that case, actually. Um, you've got a cutout there, you know, you can put the um, LCD uh, display window there on one of those uh, HXC devices, a bit like I did on my Atari ST. But the nice thing with this one, as opposed to the clear one, you can't see it. You can just about see a little lip there, can you see the light? But actually from the front it looks uh, just like the original so the only thing I would need to do is remove the badge from the uh, old one there uh, I think one thing you can do with that is just freeze it spray over it with some freezer spray and uh, just push from the inside very gently and it should just come off hopefully without bending it um, so I might have a go at doing that, I'll swap over to this one I've got a full key set that would go with this uh, I've got a black a set of black keys and a set of white keys so the black keys I could use for the function keys and the um, Amiga keys and things like that and the, the remainder of the keys could all be white so it might look quite good, it might be a nice combination so yeah, there we go, all fixed and uh, reassembled, everything's fine I'll stick uh, this test in and I'll uh, let it do uh, a test, you can see how bright that is now, that was not visible at all. Um, I'll let it do a memory test for, I don't know, four or five hours. I'll contact Cathers now and uh, arrange for this to be re-delivered, you know, sent back to him. I am so going to miss this 4000, it's uh, been great working on this. One bit of good news is uh, Stephen Leary um, contacted me actually and uh, pointed out he's got a uh, spare board uh, with lots of corrosion and stuff he said I can have for the cost of postage which is just unbelievable I am incredibly grateful for that offer um, he might have had too much to drink before he sent that message he, he might want to retract it yet when he uh, sees what he put but uh, yeah that would just be amazing because if I could get an A4000 board I could then see, uh, search for a case power supply I can deal with myself one way or another um, and uh, you know maybe at some point try and build one up I do hope you found the video interesting and I'll catch you in the next video.